Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us today. We're going to get started in a few minutes, so please hang tight. Hello everyone and greetings from the Hilltop. Welcome to today's webinar on the business of sustainable investments, sponsored by Georgetown McDonough's Office of Alumni Relations. We're so glad to have you on the line. Thank you for taking time out of your work days to connect virtually with us. Today's webinar is presented by Vishal Agarwal, Provost, Distinguished LaPierre Family Associate Professor, whose main research focus is sustainable operations, focusing on managerial challenges at the interface of business and the environment. Professor Agarwal is joined today by Jeff Cohen, MBA alumnus from the class of 2011, who is head of private investments at the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board. My name is Lauren Apicella, and I'm Associate Director of Alumni Relations for Georgetown McDonough. I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Before we get started, I would like to share a few tips and reminders with you. This webinar broadcast is being recorded. The recording of this webinar will be made available on our alumni events page, as well as the Georgetown McDonough YouTube channel within five business days of today's broadcast. You will receive the link to the webinar recording in a follow-up email, which will also contain a post webinar survey for you to take, information on upcoming webinars, and more ways to stay connected to Georgetown McDonough. We are working to offer more opportunities for alumni to engage with us online, so please do keep checking our events page as it is updated quite frequently. We solicited questions from attendees through our registration page, and Jeff and, Jeff and Vishal will discuss them throughout the panel. Um, but we will also take questions throughout the webinar, so please send in your questions as you have them using the Q&A function at the bottom of the Zoom screen. 
Finally, if you're having any technical difficulties or other issues, please submit those concerns to me via the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Before we get started, I am pleased to introduce Dean Paul Almeida to discuss the current COVID-19 situation and Georgetown McDonough's response. Dean Almeida will take a few questions as well. Please be sure to submit any questions you might have for Dean Almeida through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Dean Almeida? Thank you, Lauren. Uh, good afternoon to all our alumni. Thank you for joining us today for the sustainability webinar. Uh, I can only imagine what challenges you're facing yourself in your personal lives or professional lives. So I'm very grateful to you for taking to the time to join this meeting. And we appreciate your continued support of our school. Uh, this gives us a sense of continuity and stability in these strange times. Uh, thank you, Lauren, for inviting me and for organizing this seminar. And thanks to Vishal Agarwal and Jeff Cohen for talking to us today about sustainability, a topic that's becoming ever more important and prevalent. So uh, I'd like to give you just a bit of an update and a sense of where we're going as a school. Uh, we're all teleworking and, uh, you know, I've seen some of the advantages. My dog is very happy to have me at home all the time. And uh, I occasionally put on a coat, but not very often. So it's much more comfortable in general, but I miss roaming the halls and I miss chatting with our students and uh, faculty and staff and alumni and visitors. And I'm looking forward to the day when we can all be together again in Hariri and you can come and visit us there again. So this has been quite a time, uh, but the bottom line is this, we're very happy with how our school has responded to the coronavirus situation. And we're grateful to have a community that's been as bright and resilient uh, as the one we have. You know, in a space of a few days, we moved nearly 3,000 students and around 300 faculty and staff to working, teaching, and learning in a virtual environment. We needed to deal with complexities like our global residencies uh, we had hundreds of students who were already abroad when the crisis began, and we had to bring them all back safely. And we had to create alternative op uh, options for other students who suddenly, two days, and they couldn't go for their residencies. And our students and our community responded very well. I'm amazed that nearly 100% of them have attended classes, submitted their assignments, and been involved fully. Uh, they've been extremely wonderful in adapting to these challenging times. And their determination to persist in spite of long Zoom sessions, you know, distancing from their friends, changes in the internship and job market world, remind me of all of us why we're lucky to be part of higher education and Georgetown. We'll continue to do our best by our students, and I know you will continue to engage with us and help your colleagues, your, the future students, to continue to prosper. So in the last week, we've transitioned to a telework, teleteach, telelearn environment, but we know we have a long way to go. We need to move from a sprint to a middle distance race and then on to a marathon. And always we need to focus on the future. So we're working, of course, on admissions and jobs and internships in a very new environment. And as we look to the future, we're working on various scenarios for the fall so that come what may, we can give our students the best possible learning experience. And this seminar is an example of how we're continuing to build for the future. We've identified four areas that we think are going to be very important to our students, to our alumni in the future, business and global affairs, AI and the future of work, the business of health, and today's topic on sustainable businesses. 
Though many aspects of the future are uncertain, we know that these topics will become even more important in the future to businesses, to governments, to our students, to our alumni. Though the present is challenging, we have to continue to focus on the future, and that's what we're going to do. You know, the landscape of business education is going to look very different on the other side of the crisis. But this situation offers us an opportunity to transform our school so we can be even more successful in the future. So we will adapt to new ways of working and teaching and learning while continuing to play off our many strengths and treasuring so much that's already good at Georgetown McDonough. Our community is our strength. And I know that together, the alumni, the students, the faculty, the staff, as one McDonough, we'll be ready for the new world of business and of business education. So thank you all so much uh, for what you do for us, for engaging with our students, for helping us with jobs and internships, for coming back on panels, for guest teaching. Please continue to engage with us. And uh, I look forward to answering any questions that you may have. So thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you, Dean Almeida, for your time today. If anybody has any questions about our response to the COVID-19 situation, uh, please visit our website at msb.georgetown.edu. Let's get started uh, with the sustainability conversation. Uh, Vishal and Jeff, why don't you start by talking more about what you do both, both at Georgetown McDonough and at the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board? Great, thank you, Lauren. Uh, perhaps I'll just get started. So as Lauren mentioned, I'm a professor at MSB at Georgetown. Um, my research focus is mainly on sustainable operations, looking at a wide variety of topics that businesses face from how to design their business models to circular economy, product development, supply chain, and so on. Apart from that, most of my teaching at Georgetown is also in these areas. As you can imagine, our students are very excited and interested in these topics. So it's sort of a pleasure to be able to sort of teach on these topics as well. In addition to that, uh, I'm the academic director of our newly launched MBA certificate in sustainable business. And across all of these sort of activities, one of the approaches that we take to sustainability is to take a business oriented approach. So what do I mean by that? There's many different perspectives to sustainability. You can come at it from the perspective of ethical behavior or corporate social responsibility and PR. Uh, but sort of my focus has been around strategies and decisions where companies are sort of looking at the financial bottom line and thinking about how these considerations augment or affect their profitability and how they can improve both just not their um, environmental or social performance, but also their financial performance. And so I sort of wanted to set that up for our conversation today that a lot of companies and a lot of industries where we talk about sustainability, companies are primarily viewing that as how it intersects with their financial and economic performance. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff to learn more about what he does at SASP and how this sort of approach aligns or does not align with his industry. Thanks, Professor Agawal. Thank you, uh, Dean Almeida and Lauren, for uh, having me here today. Um, so uh, just to give a brief background on the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, or, or SASB for short, uh, we are an independent, <clears throat> not-for-profit standard-setting organization that is focused on identifying industry-specific and financially material ESG factors that are likely to be of interest and relevance to investors and within the control and likely to influence the profitability or the accounting performance of companies. Uh, in this way, we are looking to, through the uh, development of standards, uh, create consistent and comparable information that will allow for uh, a better understanding, not only from a comparability standpoint for investors, but also a, a direct transition or connection between how an ESG factor is going to affect a company's financial performance. Um, my role within SASB 
is as the head of private investments initiatives as well as a product strategist. What I do is work very closely with investment managers across all asset classes, institutional asset owners, ranging from pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, endowments, um, as well as third party uh, platforms and service providers that uh, develop data sets, service offerings, and advisory services that are integrating elements of the SASB standards into an ESG integrated process, which ultimately is designed to be embedded into an investment decision-making process, uh, which is really all about assessing how these factors affect profitability, highly consistent with Professor Agarwal's work. Very happy to be a part of this. Great, thanks, uh, Jeff. Um, and in fact, one of the questions as I was thinking about this conversation, and perhaps the others would also love to hear about this, is that when you think about sustainability and investments, there's a lot of these terms you keep hearing about ESG, SRI, impact investing. And so it would be really helpful to sort of hear from you how you think about these terms, how do you differentiate between them, what can make us, including me, a savvy, um, have good and savvier conversations about these terms. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and the reality of the matter is that if you ask uh, 100 different people that are in the industry, you'll probably get 110 different answers. Um, there is definitely a lack of uh, definition around these terms. Um, but for the sake of this conversation, I'll provide um, what I believe are appropriate uh, ways in which you can think about the landscape. But ultimately, when you are having conversations about the space, <clears throat> focusing more on the, the intent of the person that you're speaking with and what they're looking to uh, aim to achieve is really more important than the label that's being applied. That said, for the sake of this conversation, I'll walk you through some general, uh, well-accepted uh, principles and thoughts around how you can think about these various terms. Um, let's start with sustainable investing. That's typically used as a bit of a catch-all or an umbrella definition to define multiple different approaches uh, to incorporating sustainability considerations into an investment strategy. There's, our, there's also socially responsible investing or responsible investing. This is typically driven by adherence to values or avoiding contributing to um, negative outcomes such as uh, uh, in, in avoiding investing in sin stocks uh, pertaining to gaming, alcohol, uh, pornography, tobacco, etc. And a lot of the roots of SRI or socially responsible investing or responsible or investing uh, come uh, in the form of uh, activism as well as uh, faith-based exclusionary screens to align an investment portfolio with a set of values, uh, whether it's uh, avoiding um, historically uh, organizations that were contributing or involved in apartheid in South Africa or uh, simply looking to avoid uh, heavy fossil fuel emitting uh, <clears throat> investments that can be perceived as a values-based or an, a socially responsible type of approach to investing. There's also an expression that's often commonly used called mission-driven investing. This is typically a, um, a term that is heavily leveraged in, amongst foundations and in the philanthropic community, where typically there are uh, foundations that are designed with an express intent uh, either to um, focus on uh, preventing some sort of societal ill or contributing to some sort of positive environmental outcome. That is effectively the mission of that not-for-profit organization. And aligning the endowment or the investment pool of capital that is to fund that organization can be um, classified as mission-driven investing. And then there are also some legal definitions associated with a different kind of uh, mission-related investments. A couple of others that are often commonly used are impact investing. Um, this is typically used when the, the person deploying an impact investing strategy is not only seeking some form of uh, market rate financial risk adjusted return, but also to explicitly contribute positively towards some sort of social or environmental outcome. Whether that be transitioning to a low carbon economy, promoting diversity and inclusion, or even ending human trafficking. Uh, these can be both market rate investments or in some cases concessionary uh, investments from a risk adjusted return standpoint. Uh, so just even the term impact investing can take on very different approaches. 
And then finally, there's ESG. <clears throat> this term is probably used the most broadly and um, the most um, in, in the most different types of ways. Um, the way uh, I define it or the way that SASB approaches ESG is these are simply factors, environmental, social, and governance factors that are relevant and affect companies not only in the way in which they think about their profitability, but their, um, the way in which they are acting in their local communities into the various stakeholders in which they affect. So you can think about it as a set of factors that are likely to drive business decisions or uh, the investment worthiness of a specific company. But ESG is also oftentimes used as a style of investing where the investment manager uh, is considering or integrating environmental, social, and governance factors in various forms to uh, ultimately add to the total mix of information that will help them make a more informed investment decision. And sometimes that's a label that is given to them called ESG investing. Uh, but in reality, you can incorporate ESG factors whether you label yourself an ESG investor or not. Um, so I'll just pause there. There are countless more. If you have questions about any other terms, please feel free to use the chat. Um, and if you may certainly disagree with me, and that's perfectly fine. Um, but these are some just general ways to think about the most commonly used terms in the field. Great. That was very helpful, uh, Jeff. In fact, it really was insightful for me to sort of be able to systematically think about the differences between them. And I'm seeing a few comments from our attendees as well, how much they're appreciating this sort of definition. And I think the sort of the next question I have is, especially focusing around ESG being these factors, a very common question is about how do you go about sort of measuring these and what kind of metrics are uh, analysts using when they're trying to measure this to add to that information and decision making? Absolutely. Um, and, and for the sake of this question, uh, I'll focus on metrics that analysts use when making decisions around investments. And this can apply in both a public markets context, investing in corporate credit or public equity, or even in the private markets, um, because ultimately an industry specific financially material ESG issue matters both in the listed and in the unlisted um, space. Um, so the, the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board focuses on issues that are likely to be material for a specific industry. Not all ESG issues are likely to be financially material in every industry. I'll give you some ones that are, and then I'll talk about the ones that are not likely to appear in the SASB standards. So just to give you a few examples, in the metals and mining industry, one of the SASB uh, metrics that are identified as likely to be financially material, where we are promoting the disclosure of this content and investors have indicated that they have found this to be of use in their analysis, pertains to the total weight of tailings waste and the percentage of that waste in which is recycled. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the really tragic incident in, uh, with Valet down in Brazil and that tailings uh, dam collapse and all of the different um, not only societal and environmental uh, adverse outcomes, but the financial outcomes that resulted from this. That's a very specific metric to the metals and mining industry. Now thinking about a different industry such as meat, poultry, and dairy, one of the metrics that we've identified that's likely to uh, illuminate information that will inform a material decision for an investors is the percentage of cage-free uh, shell egg sales. Now switching to a completely different industry like air freight and logistics, uh, the percentage of drivers classified as independent contractors can be really useful information in thinking about um, the nature of the labor force that reports up to company management and whether there might be some potential issues around uh, treatment of that workforce, how they're compensated, and any other issues that might arise. So as you can see, these are all highly specific to the majority of companies within a specific industry and we are not asking software companies, for instance, nor are we suggesting that software companies necessarily need to disclose their GHG emissions. That's short for greenhouse gas emissions. While it's certainly relevant for people and planet, how much a company is emitting irrespective of what industry you're there in, the likelihood of uh, a software company either doubling or cutting their emissions in half is likely to be uh, all else being equal, negligible to their financial performance. 
So we are really focused on the things that really do matter in industry. So in the software space, that would be uh, data security, customer privacy, for instance, as well as diversity and inclusion, the market has found to be financially material. And one thing I wanted to really reiterate <clears throat> um, is that all of the standards that I've outlined have been identified by consultation with hundreds of investors, companies, academics, civil society, and other subject matter experts, that they have identified that these factors within an industry are not only A, of interest to investors to inform their analysis, but B, likely to be financially material in that they will potentially affect a company's cost of capital, potentially affect a company's contingent liabilities, or even have um, potential opportunities to capture new markets and, and facilitate revenue growth. Thinking about um, organic food lines in uh, the food and beverage space in the processed food space or alternative uh, meat and dairy. And you've seen the success of uh, the IPOs associated with um, uh, the impossible brands and the beyond, uh, the beyond brands uh, and their success. So it's not just risk mitigants or potential things that would adversely impact a company, but it's also whether a company is strategically positioned to capture new opportunities as uh, innovation, regulation, and other market dynamics take hold. So I'm focusing on the, the factors that an analyst that, that would be a, a assessing a company would find to be useful, um, <clears throat> not focusing currently in this response, uh, Professor Agarwal on how funds or investors themselves are assessed by third parties. Yeah, that's very useful. So it's, it's, you know, so you sort of laid out multiple steps in there. So one, we have to figure out what metrics are worth considering. And then I think you made a very important point. What metrics are material for the financial returns for a specific industry? And as you just gave some great examples for ones which may be relevant or not. So I guess the other question I sort of have is you talked a little bit about how you go about compiling the kind of metrics to look at. Could you talk a little bit more, if possible, about how you try to figure out um, whether a metric is material and has an impact on financial returns within a given industry? Um, is that sort of a similar process to what you mentioned, or is there something unique about it? The way in which the SASB set the standards was very similar to how uh, conventional accounting standards were set. They were done in a fully transparent, uh, public domain where we effectively ensured that they were informed by the market and that the market was providing evidence of these connections. So if a ESG factor, let's just uh, use a one for example like uh, employee health and safety, uh, in order for us to determine uh, whether that issue is going to be material within an industry because we take an industry by industry approach, we need to have information, a significant amount of evidence and information from the market that that information is A, likely to be of interest to investors because why would you ever create a corporate reporting platform to ask companies to disclose information that investors don't want? Um, and B, is there um, historical evidence, quantitative evidence, uh, and even anecdotal evidence where there may be a dearth of information that these factors have been able to either positively or negatively contribute to some area of accounting performance. And we've identified 13 uh, different financial value drivers. I named a few in my previous response, but a few others, think CapEx, operating expenses, extraordinary expenses, uh, divestment risk, uh, market share, things along those lines. So we will uh, run this transparent process for which we collect public comments from over, have collected rather, public comments from over a hundred different, hundreds of different stakeholders to surface this evidence. Because ultimately we want this to be a market standard, not one that is set in a vacuum in uh, sort of a, an ivory tower think tank style thing that no one is actually engaging with the practitioners of this content. Mm -hmm. um, so, and this process took nearly seven years to complete and it will be updated in an ongoing way to account for new changes in the market. Um, and some of the things that we're actively working on at SASB have to do with very key issues like content moderation on online platforms being an emerging issue. Single use plastics and its effect on uh, chemicals companies and uh, pulp and paper uh, industry and the companies within it. Um, we're also looking very even closer at the supply chain within tobacco. Um, so that is an industry that ESG factors matter, even though oftentimes it is subject to exclusionary screens. 
So these standards are intended to be a living, breathing, uh, sort of a, and highly relevant uh, resource for both investors and companies to, to turn to. Great. Um, and in fact, sort of related to that are a couple of questions that I'm seeing coming in from our audience, which relate to this. I mean, to me, it always sounds like such a complicated set of uh, analysis and process to get to this and to keep this, as you said, a living, breathing set of standards. So a couple of challenges that one might expect that we, I'd be curious to hear how you're sort of thinking about it and how to handle those. One is sort of thinking about metrics that might not be material today, but could be material in the future. Right? So how to sort of think about the projected impact of some of these. And this sort of also relates to differences in sort of the US market versus the Europe market, mm -hmm. where perhaps they're maybe focusing on some other things which may not be material today, but people might expect them to be material in the future. So how do you sort of project or incorporate those type of trends? Yeah, there's a lot in there. So I'll, I'll aim to unpack as much of it as I can. Um, so ultimately it's sometimes very difficult to predict what will and will uh, not become material in the future. And ultimately serving the needs of both companies that are disclosing this information and developing capital allocation decisions and um, uh, operational decisions based off of that, as well as investors, you have to strike a balance between not changing the standards every couple of months. Because if you think about a corporate perspective, what a pain in the butt that becomes to constantly figure out new things that they'll have to disclose. They have to develop new operational uh, considerations, new controls, work with their third party auditors and assurance providers in order to get this information out. Um, at the same time, there's always, there's this new concept of dynamic materiality that is, um, uh, getting a lot of traction amongst uh, sort of ESG scholars and, and practitioners in the space to account for new emerging issues. That's what these projects are intended to capture. As the, there is a preponderance of, uh, uh, of evidence and interest in these factors that will sort of create uh, effectively a trigger for our research team to dig into these issues more and identify, okay, are, are there specific connections to financial materiality? Um, for the majority of companies in an industry that are within the control of companies in that industry um, and are cost effective to collect. Ultimately, that those are some three of the, the core components of what we could call our conceptual framework or rules for procedure to actually set standards. So there is not a universal way in which to view this. There are certainly regional uh, nuances um, and some uh, investors think about um, materiality as more of a stakeholder materiality focus, a multi-stakeholder materiality focus. The SASB focuses uh, singularly on the investor, whereas other organizations are focused on what is not just material to investors, but also to local communities, to employees, to customers, and to um, sort of other factors that are not necessarily thinking about this company from an investment lens. Um, and then there are, of course, regional differences to apply. While the standards are globally relevant, certain issues may be more or less material in the Philippines than they are in Brazil, than they are in Spain, than they are here in the US. And um, ultimately, that's the operating context that a, a, a very skilled investment analyst will be able to look at uh, a set of material issues and identify which ones are more important to the company I'm looking at based on their supply chain, based on the location of their workers based on their customer base, because there is no need from an investment standpoint to prescriptively apply this content. Ultimately, it's both art and science uh, and understanding even for companies that are um, highly diversified and cut across multiple industries, um, how to factor in certain components and the interplay of those components with other business units, for instance. Um, so it's, uh, it's not a very linear process, nor should it be, right? Investing is very complicated. These things are both operational and financially um, relevant. So ultimately viewing this in totality and how it connects with company operations, how they all connect to one another and the overall operating context is key in order to make good use of this information. Yeah, um, exactly. And in fact, as you were sort of saying, I was thinking that maybe investors in different regions would have different things that they care about or their weights on things, right? So that could just add to more 
sort of complexity to this. Another sort of complexity in this context, which usually people come up and we have a question sort of uh, related to this, is that sometimes, and but this is the case with any sort of standards, what you may be measuring, uh, you know, there's this whole issue of greenwashing, whether um, if let's say if something is material like publishing and disclosures of impact, but yet companies might do things which are difficult to measure, difficult to figure out, may have a more of a longer term perspective. Does that pose immense challenges or are there ways to sort of that the industry is thinking about these kind of greenwashing concerns? Greenwashing is absolutely a challenge. Um, but the, the, the sort of the nice thing about greenwashing ultimately is that if companies or investors are doing it, increasingly as others who are doing it with credibility and, and genuine focus are doing it, there is increased sophistication in the market. And those who have sort of committed to it as a marketing ploy will eventually be held to account. And they'll either stop greenwashing or they'll realize that they actually have to adhere to the, the claims that they've made. Um, that's a bit of an aside, but um, greenwashing exists and it exists both um, with investors claiming that they are creating great impact or integrating ESG into their analysis when perhaps they're not, or maybe they're doing it at a very surface level. And then there's a greenwashing phenomenon that exists at the corporate level, um, which can oftentimes be seen with uh, a cherry picking phenomenon where they'll only focus on um, the metrics or the components that will paint them in a very positive light, or they'll really highlight certain things that are maybe of interest to their local communities, but have absolutely no relevance to investors because they're trying to focus on uh, the great volunteerism that they're promoting within their organization, which is a wonderful thing, but irrelevant from an investment standpoint. So part of what I believe is a way in which greenwashing can be um, eschewed, uh, as well as um, the phenomenon to be a little bit less um, uh, challenging and sort of uh, poignant is, is to really think about what is consistent and comparable and think about the stakeholder for which you are looking to communicate. Um, and ultimately having quantitative year over year metrics will hold that to account and you don't fall victim to um, the case study phenomenon or the storytelling phenomenon, which is fantastic. You need that. But when you pair hard data that is identified through metrics, which can be compared across a peer group with the stories, with the narratives that ultimately shape that performance, then you have the rigor and the credibility paired with the storytelling that ultimately helps to reduce the amount of greenwashing in the space. And that applies both to companies as well as to investment managers. Great. And in fact, one of the things I always think, which is sort of a pattern across similar issues, is that we cannot sort of wait for perfect strategies, perfect standards, perfect disclosures, uh, because those are pretty much impossible to do. And in fact, what you want, I think I liked what you said earlier, you want standards and disclosures and patterns which are rigorous, objective, uh, sort of stable, but yet adapting just so that people will actually adopt them, right? No point waiting for a perfect standard uh, if nobody can adopt it, right? So, um, yeah, so with that, maybe another question I'll ask, and I think a lot of our attendees would love to hear about this. I'm seeing these questions come in. When you sort of think about the three parts of ESG, the environmental, the social, and the governance, um, how do you see the current situation with COVID affecting this? There's some discussion about it perhaps causing more of a focus on the S part, the social part, than the others, uh, maybe thinking more about operating risks related to healthcare. What's sort of your perspective in this really dynamic, volatile sort of uh, space we're in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that historically, um, in sort of the ESG landscape, there's been more of a focus on the E part in for partially because there was more data. Uh, there is more data out there, um, and there have been a lot of fantastic initiatives related to climate, um, related to oceans, related to all sorts of environmental components. Um, the pandemic has, is shining a light not just on the environmental component and what we're seeing with oil prices, the reduction in GHG emissions, but things like business continuity risk, systemic risk, worker health and safety, employee benefits and engagement, 
these are being stress tested in a significant way. And companies that have thought really hard about these issues and are being highly responsive uh, are all else being equal, performing better uh, around these issues than those that are maybe being highly dismissive of that. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily changing the importance of these factors. They've always been important. They're just being significantly stress tested at this point. Thinking about all of the negative press that you're seeing around, um, around the Amazon and the way in which they're treating their workers, uh, that certainly had an impact uh, around uh, perception and, and the way in which uh, they're acting. Um, there's uh, a lot of press around um, these, uh, a lot of these sort of health and wellness issues uh, as it pertains to um, uh, various grocery store workers as well as workers within various meat manufacturing uh, uh, plants and processing plants. Uh, from a business continuity standpoint, uh, did various organizations have good um, technology technology practices in place so that they could transition to a more remote environment. Um, and then ultimately, how are they treating their employees? Uh, are they focused on uh, keeping them engaged? Are they focused on some of these issues? These are all issues that have mattered um, and have always uh, led to certain retention factors, um, have led to a lot of uh, investors incorporating Glassdoor as an input uh, to identify various potential social issues that may be emerging. Um, but really, this is just unveiling issues that have always mattered. Uh, we just could have never predicted which sort of black swan event would have uh, put these to the test. So that's what we've identified. Um, ultimately, um, I think that there are a few organizations that highlighted the risks of a pandemic, including FAIR, um, which is a wonderful not-for-profit focused on um, you know, equitable treatment of animal welfare and, and, and food. Um, but ultimately, I think that incorporating aspects related to pandemics will be a, a, a future work stream for us at SASB as well. Great, and in fact, another thing, sort of discussion I'm seeing play out in the media and in different outlets is sort of what all of this means for the importance of ESG and sustainable investing as a general idea. One argument is sort of, companies are not gonna think so much about it. They're dealing with this in short term and that's what they're focused on. So maybe it won't be as active. The other argument which I read recently with some data is that companies who were scoring better on ESG and sustainability, you know, resiliency is sort of a part of sustainability and in fact have had fewer negative impacts. And so sort of where do you see that sort of uh, that line of the debate and the, the divide based on your opinion? Yeah, I, I think that in any type of uh, downturn or crisis, uh, doing anything new is, whether it be ESG or otherwise, is likely to, um, to be paused or potentially stopped. So if an organization, be it a company or an investment organization, is thinking about or considering ESG, odds are they're probably going to, to put to pause that. Uh, only because it's new, they haven't committed any resources to it, um, and it's maybe just not been in the forefront of their thinking. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's a prudent strategy, but I think that that's just a general phenomenon. Um, as far as are they, are firms who are already actively doing this going to ditch sustainability or ESG initiatives? Uh, I think the answer is absolutely not, um, because those, many of these issues are likely going to be risk mitigant uh, you know, type of initiatives or will help with their scores amongst third party data providers that ultimately leads to uh, better scores and a lot of organizations, investment organizations are building investment methodologies based on ESG assessments. In fact, there are many of which that directly link the construction of indices to performance consistent with financially material issues. So all of a sudden, if you are abandoning um, practices uh, around improving material issues, not only are you likely exposing yourself to more risk or missing out on opportunities, you're not gonna score as well as a company uh, in an MSCI, uh, in a State Street R factor, uh, in a Sustainalytics assessment, in an ISS ESG assessment, just to name a few. Um, 
and that's going to lead to outflows purely from an investment methodological standpoint. Um, and whether they have a benevolent agenda or they're just trying to maximize shareholder uh, return, it would behoove companies to manage these issues, even just focusing on the material ones. So I think you'll see a bit of both, um, but ultimately this is intended to be long-term benefits to companies and investors. And there's a lot of great literature out there that shows that um, investment managers who have integrated ESG into their analysis have by and large outperformed traditional uh, market benchmarks, not primarily because they were under allocated to heavy industry, but primarily because of better security selection. They are investing in companies that are managing these issues, that are investing in these issues, and they are better positioned to deal with stresses like what we're experiencing now. So that was a, a bit of a multi-pronged answer, but a very difficult question where I think you'll see a bit of everything. Um, and, and part of it also is uh, there's a, a market cap phenomenon. Uh, smaller companies are resource constrained um, and ultimately first and foremost, ensuring that the company is viable needs to be the priority of these officers. But these type of initiatives can ensure that viability going forward. So whether it just delays these issues a little bit um, uh, and then sort of re-accelerates them once we come out of this, I, I think is what will likely happen. Yeah, that was very helpful. Thank you for such a timely question and it was really helpful. Um, before I move on to the next question, I'll just sort of remind our attendees, if you have any other questions, feel free to use the Q&A function and send them to us. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask you was, it's from one of our attendees who works for an infrastructure private equity fund, but it's quite similar to questions I've been asked by multiple companies. Uh, there's sort of a growing number of standards, reporting protocols. So we have SASB, of course, which are affiliated with this, this the TCFD, uh, there's many others. Um, and so how do you sort of think about the space and all these options available? How should companies and firms choose between them? Do you think, just to add more questions to your plate, do you think there'll be some collaboration or differentiation between these as we sort of see this space evolve? Absolutely, and this is a, a big challenge in the industry, especially for investors. They see, um, you know, millions of acronyms, the, the TCFD, SASB, PRI, GRESB, um, I could go on and on. Um, but the idea is that it's not sort of choosing between them, but they're all really interconnected and they empower one another. It's like a complex system. It's not linear, but by focusing on one, it can actually empower you to do another. Uh, and then there are add-on effects. So there's a lot of scalability in thinking about um, how you might want to proceed. Uh, in private markets with a focus on infrastructure, um, uh, the Global Real Estate uh, Standards Board, which also focuses heavily on infrastructure, does a phenomenal job um, in zeroing in on what are the appropriate types of uh, questions when taking a look at a port or taking a look at uh, a toll road or taking a look at you know, some other infrastructure asset. What are the material issues that are likely going to be relevant from an ESG standpoint to take a close look at? And by doing that, there's actually a way in which you can communicate to your investors, whether those uh, assets and, and in what degree they're exposed to physical risk, transition risk, and regulatory risk, which are the three primary uh, areas highlighted in the Task Force for Climate Financial Disclosure, or TCFD for short. And the TCFD, in large part, was actually based on research performed by SASB. And SASB is cited as one of the primary implementation mechanisms to achieve the recommendations within the TCFD. So I, I won't you know, go into too many more of these interconnections, but the idea is that um, they all work together. Uh, it's not always very clear and obvious. And that's a big uh, initiative that we're undertaking at SASB and I'm, I'm doing quite a bit of work around this. For, so for the individual who asked that question, I'm happy to connect with you. Uh, offline as well. Um, but the idea is that we're all moving together. We're working to harmonize and rationalize our work so that a small investment organization that needs to understand where to, to invest their time and energy can do so in the most scalable way that will not only uh, 
create value within their underlying assets, protect against risk in the due diligence process, but that they can communicate that credibly to their limited partners. Great, thanks, uh, thanks, Jeff. Um, so another question we sort of have is from the audience is what sort of role do you see the public accounting firms providing in this sort of space? Is there demand for this sort of uh, um, help and sort of to look over assurance over compliance with these kind of standards? Absolutely, and I, uh, that's the direction that ultimately many want to see this go um, because a, a a good, skeptical, prudent investor should be a little concerned with any information, ESG or otherwise, that isn't third-party verified and assured or audited, right? I think that that's just generally good practice. Currently, a lot of ESG disclosed information has not been third-party verified or assured, but more and more that's becoming the norm. And ultimately that's the direction that we're likely going. So um, the big four accounting firms are, are, are big supporters of SASB. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are looking to effectively, if you think about it, just from a, from a financial standpoint, that is a very big potential uh, you know, new business line um, for these types of organizations. Um, so it would behoove that the accounting industry for a set of standards to emerge. Um, so that they can be audited too and verified. So uh, ultimately, I think that um, getting companies first and foremost to disclose is, is a great first step. Um, going from disclosing nothing around ESG to disclosing financially material ESG information that's uh, quantitative, uh, third-party verified is going from sitting to sprinting. Ultimately, there are a lot of intermittent steps along the way. So I believe that these types of organizations, the accounting organization will play a very big role in shaping this going forward, not in shaping what they think is or is not material, but simply by ensuring that companies are uh, credibly and accurately disclosing this information consistent with the various different sets of standards for which they are uh, claiming uh, information that is aligned with. Great, thanks, Jeff. And as we sort of get closer towards the end of this webinar, another question I wanted to ask you, beyond just COVID, where do you sort of see the future of ESG and sustainable investing going? What are you sort of excited about? What should we be excited about? Yeah, uh, it's the, the crystal ball question. It comes up very often. Um, I believe that this industry is only going to grow. How it will grow is, is the million dollar question. Some theorize that the quote unquote ESG uh, job will eventually disappear and that it's just going to be integrated into uh, good investment analysis, uh, good operational thinking, good risk management, um, business development, uh, investor relations. Um, those, uh, that's one theory. But if you look at the actual job market, you looked at LinkedIn, you looked at various firms posting, I can't tell you how many jobs uh, I've seen, it's just countless, where they're looking for folks to be able to um, help spearhead ESG initiatives, help to internalize that and bring that to bear. Um, so I believe that the industry will grow, continue to grow in, in immense ways. Um, ultimately, what that means as far as job opportunities, um, in the short term, there are gonna be way, way more. In the long term, from an investment standpoint, some believe that it'll eventually be folded into just traditional investing. So for those that are looking to get into the industry, uh, not only is it very useful to have a sustainability understanding and knowledge base, but to also be able to pair that with some sort of core function, whether it be operations, whether it be finance, whether it be um, sales, whatever the case may be, uh, I think would behoove anyone interested in getting into the space uh, to ensure that they uh, have a job in the long term. Great. Thanks, Jeff. That, the entire discussion has been great. I've learned a lot. Hopefully our attendees did too. So with that, I'll just hand it over to Lauren uh, to sort of wrap up for our webinar today. Thank uh, you. Um, thank you, Jeff. And thank you, Vishal, for your time today. That was wonderful. And thank you to our attendees for joining us today for this webinar on the business of sustainable investments. As a reminder, the recording of this webinar will be made available on our alumni events page, as well as the Georgetown McDonough YouTube channel within the next five business days. 
You will receive a link to the webinar recording as well in a follow-up email, which will also contain a survey for you to take about uh, your experience with this webinar, information on upcoming webinars and other virtual events, and more ways to stay connected to Georgetown. We are working to offer more opportunities for our alumni to engage with us online, uh, so please keep checking our events page as it is updated frequently. Thank you all again for joining us and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you.